Welcome again. Right now we're on 2 Peter chapter 2. Now, I'm going to have to divide this up in a few different videos because there is, there's just so much stuff here in just this one chapter. Also for chapter 3 as well. So, I mean, it's just so full of spiritual treasure. There are some people who call anybody they disagree with a false teacher. But that is not biblical. In the whole scope of Scripture, in the whole Bible, there's only one place it uses that term false teacher, and that is right here. And it also tells you how to identify them. Verse 1, But false prophets also arose among the people, as false teachers will also be among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, denying even the master who bought them, bringing on themselves swift destruction. Many will follow their immoral ways. There is a key word right there, immoral. You see, some people, when you preach righteousness, they call you a false teacher. Here, according to the biblical definition of false teacher, false teachers are immoral people. Their doctrine supports immorality. Verse 2, many will follow their immoral ways, and as a result, the way of truth will be maligned. So to them, they will call the truth false. Truth will be a lie. The true teachers, to them, are called the false teachers. Verse 3, in covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. They are covetous people. Continuing with verse 3, whose sentence now, from of old, doesn't linger, and their destruction will not slumber. Now I'm going to skip on down here to verse 10. Now I'm going to get back to verses 4 through 10 in the next session. So the last half of verse 10 here, talking about false teachers again. They are daring, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. Now another translation calls them presumptuous, which I think is a better way of saying it. So, so far we can identify false teachers by those who are covetous, those who are presumptuous, those who are self-willed, and those who speak evil of others quite freely. Verse 11, Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, don't bring a slanderous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, that is the false teachers, as unreasoning creatures, born natural animals to be taken and destroyed. So he gets a little bit more graphic here, saying that the false teachers are like animals. Last half of verse 12, Speaking evil, again, saying speaking evil in matters about which they are ignorant, will in their destroying surely be destroyed. Receiving the wages of unrighteousness, people who count it pleasure to revel or carouse, as it says in other translations, in the daytime, spots and defects reveling in their deceit while they feast with you. So in addition to all the other characteristics of false teachers, we got those who like to carouse, who pleasure in sin. Verse 14, having eyes full of adultery. So they're adulterers and who can't cease from sin. These are not the people who preach righteousness to you. These are not the people who tell you to obey God. So false teachers are full of adultery, who can't cease from sin, enticing unsettled souls, having a heart trained in greed, accursed children, forsaking the right way, they went astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of wrongdoing. But he was rebuked for his own disobedience. A speechless donkey spoke with a man's voice and stopped the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water. They give you a hope that there's something refreshing there. Continuing with verse 17, Clouds driven by a storm, for whom the blackness of darkness has been reserved forever. For uttering great swelling words of emptiness, they entice in the lusts of the flesh. So false teachers, according to the biblical definition, are those who entice people in the lusts of the flesh. Continuing with verse 18, by licentiousness, those who are indeed escaping from those who live in error, promising them liberty, while they themselves are bondservants of corruption. See, you're either a bondservant of the law of God, or you're a bondservant of the law of Satan. You're either a bondservant of righteousness, or you're a bondservant of sin. Continuing with verse 19, For a man is brought into bondage by whoever overcomes him. So if sin overcomes you, you are a slave to sin. 
If righteousness overcomes you, you are a slave to righteousness. There is no gray area. Verse 20, for if after they have escaped the defilement of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are entangled again in it and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. Two things here. Notice it says you escape the defilement of the world through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's against what a lot of people preach today. It's like today is like, well, you just say the sinner's prayer and, oh, I know you're still defiled. You're still living like the world, but that's okay. You're covered by the blood. That is wrong. By the knowledge of Jesus Christ, you escape that. You see, Jesus doesn't want you to sin. And Jesus is not weak. He has the power to set you free from sin. Number two, notice it says here the last state of the man who backslides is worse than the first. Like how Jesus said, if if demons are cast out of you and you let them back in, they'll bring seven times more demons back in. Verse 21, for it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, quote, the dog turns to his own vomit again. And that is found in Proverbs chapter 26, verse 11. And the sow, that is the pig, that is washed to the wallowing in the mire. Why did the dog return to his vomit? And why did the pig return to the mire? That's because they were not transformed to begin with. They did not receive that new nature. They did not completely die to self. They did not completely die to the old self and rise being born again to the new nature, to the new man. So it's very, very important to be truly born again, to lay aside everything, to die to self and to rise anew. You see, the born again experience is the resurrection experience and you cannot experience the resurrection without experiencing death. Until next time, seek God with all your heart. And if you do, you will find him. Call upon him and he will show you great and mighty things. Love you guys.